So now, uh, let me introduce Antoine Guizon, although I think most of you know him quite well. Antoine did his master's in 1992 at the University of Geneva in limnology. So most of you may not have known that he is actually a limnologist. In 96, he did a PhD at the University of Geneva on modeling alpine species in a study area in the Swiss Alps. That's when he started working on SDMs for which many of us know him. In 97, he did a postdoc at Stanford University in the US and he came back in 98 and was working as a postdoc for two years at the University of Geneva and also got a permanent position at that time of the organization that is now known as InfoFauna. In 2001, he left this position to become an assistant professor at the University of Lausanne, where he later in 97 became an associate professor and in 2017 a full professor. Most of us may more worry about his scientific uh, contributions in species distribution modeling and um, macroecology in general, spatial ecology. Antoine has published more than 270 ISI papers that you can find in the web of science. He is very highly cited since 2014 in all the stats. And most known now also for this book here, where he is the first author and where he is the initiator of it, an introduction to habitat suitability and distribution models in ecology, um, practical introduction with R. Please, Antoine. Uh, welcome to the talk here. So thank you, him. Yeah, thank you very. Thanks a lot, uh, Nick. It's really nice words for you. And yeah, since so long we know each other, and it's not my first time at WSL, but it's always a big pleasure to come back. And it it was quite a while since I didn't come back, of course, due to what you know. Uh, Nick also kindly forgot to mention he's a co-author of, of, the, of the book. <laughs> so I was not alone to write it. it uh, there was also Wilfried Thuyer, but it was also a great adventure. And we, we nearly barely uh, dare saying that it took us nearly eight years to write it. So it takes a long time on the side of a scientific career. Okay, now I, I will try to present you some maybe advance on applications of SDMs that in my group uh, over the last years, trying not to repeat too much what I presented already here in the past. So I hope I won't apologize if there is a few things you know already, and certainly you will uh, I'll try to do. So I will mainly, I divided a bit talking four parts, but there's five here. Uh, it's really very quickly and I apologize already for I will probably go quite quickly on the first part because it's a bit common things, presenting SDMs and why actually we need SDMs for planning. Uh, then some recent SDM advances, some applications we did in my group that also are kind of novel, and two, I think, important challenge for, for the future of SDMs. So why spatial models? And this is really very common on it is for you. Uh, human has a big impact on biodiversity. And we uh, we know that we know the drivers, we know the causes. Uh, it causes uh, it increases the extinction risk of species, and but it also causes already extinctions or has caused ex extinctions since uh, human uh, economic and, and industrial development. And so, and we are not on track, I would say, of kind of kind of uh, bending the curve of of uh, biodiversity loss. So it, it's also one already an argument. Say so we we know that we have been trying. You see all these initiatives um, of the time from the Club of Rome in the past to to now with IPBES, IPCC, all these bodies that have tried to bend the curve, but we are not yet there. And we especially more than ever need to plan a bit our future. And I think SEMs can be useful in this regard. And there is also another component than just biodiversity and species. It's also ecosystem services, now increasingly called uh, nature contribution to people, NCPs. I would keep using ecosystem service because it's in the name of IPES first. And it's also many papers still use this term. But 
what uh, ecosystem services are is, is were really created to try to 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 show non biologists probably and society the interest of protecting biodiversity as it provides service for human, you all know this, and it, it also supports human well-being. So there were some efforts uh, to map, for instance, ecosystem service and to make projections. Uh, you, you find this type of report with changes in ecosystem service delivery by, for instance, 2050 here for different ecosystem service. These are just three examples, uh, water regulation, sorry, erosion on air, qu air quality. It is often based on um, mapping, for instance, long use land cover or some more complex models that directly model ecosystem services. And combined with biodiversity are extremely important component of uh, a future sustainable way of managing our landscape and our nature. And I, I, I think this framework by IPDES has become central. Uh, it should at least become central in policy making in most countries in the future. I hope it will. And one very important aspect is link between direct factors and nature that then provide uh, contributions to people and the need to, if we want to make projections, to develop models and scenarios that can try to anticipate the, the change at this level. So, of course, you can do predictions in, in space to try to generalize information We'll see this, and, and for instance, to support systematic uh, conservation planning, which is more than ever needed. And but also projections, of course, in time to know, for instance, what will happen with future climate change or future land use change. And one key projection tool is uh, species distribution models. You see the graph that is extracted on the on the right from uh, Arojo et al. Uh, 2019. That really shows increase in, in the the development of SDMs for different conservation issues in, in the literature. And uh, Nick mentioned our book, but there are also other books earlier that were published on the topic. So it's, it's kind of has developed quite exponentially and has developed in a quite mature uh, field, but there is still quite, I think, also a lot still to develop. It was applied, of course, to many types of organisms. And sorry, this is a bit centered on our work, but it, it shows already that you can apply to nearly uh, every ecosystem, every organism on Earth on, on at various scales. And in the following, I will mostly uh, take example from the Swiss Alps near Lausanne, uh, the Alps of Beau, uh, where we have developed uh, data and uh, published many papers over the last years. So it has actually become a priority uh, research area for the new mountain center in Lausanne. Uh, and it's, it's an area where uh, a lot of data have been collected on not only natural science, but also social science. So you can start to cross a bit the information. But for today, I will mostly focus on the data we sampled on, on species on developing environmental variables. And so this is uh, the, the study area in more details. It's a mountain area of about 700 square kilometer. Um, it's the whole out of the state of Vaux. And you see that we have been sampling different taxonomic groups. Uh, so we have quite good data for batrations, amphibians, for some insect groups, for plants, and for now our soil microorganisms, and you will see later. And we've, of course, also gathered a, a large set of environmental predictors to try to. to that we can use in SDMs. So including not only climate and topography, but also uh, soil now variables uh, on, for instance, snow cover duration on other variables. And of course, when you build species distribution models, it has become now very uh, spread and very common to stack them to try to predict other properties such as diversity or composition and functions. Um, and of course, then from that, you can also predict in theory ecosystems or ecosystem services. I would come back. So one example where you can use stacked SDMs to predict ecosystem services well, this is, is in this paper. And there is actually quite still few papers that have been doing that. Uh, this was a, a paper led by Miguel Arojo 
um, and trying to, to anticipate how um, control by vertebrate of two groups here, invertebrates and rodent pests, um, will change in the future with climate change. And so it's just modeling the mammals that, that provide control on these groups and stacking them and showing how cumulatively um, you will see change in the future. So th this was just to set the scene. Um, I will try now to present you a few advances that I think are, are quite important. I I'll start just with the use of artificial data, but I will be very brief because I think it's also illustrated then in some examples, but it's, I think, something very important. It's not so new, as you can see. It started, I would say, in, in 2001, probably before, but it's a bit hidden in the gray literature. In Australia, they, they used it already quite long ago, and Austin was already involved in this type of things very long ago. But at least these are a few, uh, a sample of papers where you can see the importance of using artificial data. And I think it's very important because it, it, it allows really to test some properties of SEMs in a very powerful way. And I've, just two examples, we used it, for instance, and that was a very nice collaboration with the PFL, with the statistic, statistical department there, to try to really build a framework where you can test the relative effect of different factors on SEMs. Uh, but where you really keep the relative effect from one factor on the others. And so you, you can have factors that are significant, that have a significant effect, but are not big importance compared to other factors, or are not creating a big effect. And what we found, for instance, and this is just valid for our study area in the Swiss Alps uh, of Beau, uh, is that, for instance, sample size and modeling techniques, the choice of techniques or, or the, the, the size of your sample is way more important has more as much bigger effect on SEMs than, for instance, spatial integration. I didn't put it here, but we later published a paper that shows we have very little problems with spatial integration in our data in the Swiss Alps, likely because it's a very rough, rugged uh, mountain area where there is many environmental factors vary, varying at very short distance that really mess up the, the, the risk of spatial integration. Uh, and yeah, other factors like sample, sample bias, sampling bias have a, have a lower impact than, for instance, sample size and modeling techniques. And so that's, I think, is quite known, but it's very important because here you can really show uh, that sample size is much bigger compared, for instance, to spatial integration in the same data. And using the same type of approach, another thing we, we, we did uh, was to try to add cumulatively uh, errors in the, the input data, the species data, to see how it affects the model. So how, how much errors you need to add to get, uh, to, to, to decrease your uh, model predictive power. And we tested it with both uh, predictive power on fit. You see, you, I, I should show here. Yeah, it's like you have the two columns. Oh, sorry, <laughs> not very, this one on this one. Uh, sorry, you have the, here, model fit probability on the predictive success. And we tested the, the addition of false positive on false negative. And you, I don't know if you see it very well, we, you, you see different metrics that were used here for, oh, not very good yet, uh, to test on different modeling techniques. And what you see mostly is that with the false negative, by increase, especially I think with predictive success, which is the most important, you see that actually decrease much less fast for the same num for, for the same error added and up to 50% you see here than the um, false positive, so the presence. So what, what it means is that creating false positive is as a much greater impact than, than creating false negative. This is not often acknowledged and not often clearly assessed when we evaluate models. And we, as you could see, we put, we could, using the same framework as before, play at the same time with sample size modeling techniques and prevalence. Another advance I think is quite important is that we all know ensemble modeling procedure that was started by uh, Wilfried Tui, I would say, on, on Miguel Arojo in the, shortly after the year 2000. And it's working well, many package implemented, so it's, it's kind of, powerful approach, but we proposed uh, some years ago, and actually that was also a nice collaboration 
with WSL, with Mikhail and Ariel Bergamini as well, um, to an, an approach that is based actually on ensemble modeling, but that consider only small models of two predators at a time, and that allows modeling species with very small sample size. So you, you, you can, for instance, use many more predictors than you would be able to put in a single model if you have few occurrences, but you only build model, bivariate models with two variables at a time, and then you ensemble them in a weighted manner to get the final predictions. And actually, the results are, are quite impressive, because you see that compared to standard SEMs, uh, yeah, it should work, I know, here. Sorry, compared to standard SEM, so you have a standard and an ESM, and you see that for species with less than 25 occurrence, it's quite a very, very big improvement. It's still an improvement for species between 25 and 50 occurrence, and it be, it, it's still an improvement, but less with species with more than 50 occurrence. So even for quite common species, it's still a more powerful approach. Of course, it requires much more computing power, so you have to, to, to manage. And we also tested the use of different modeling techniques and you can build the ensemble of small models with only one uh, modeling techniques or with an ensemble of technique, which becomes an ensemble of ensemble if you want. Um, but it doesn't really improve the, the predictions as you can see here. Oh, sorry, I always use the wrong one. Uh, you see that all the bars here uh, are more or less at the same level of average. So here is the ensemble, and uh, these are the three individual techniques, and it, it basically provides the same performance. So one of the nice conclusions as well is that you can use ESMs with only one technique, which reduce the computing time, and you get nearly the same performance, whatever, it, not exactly, because we showed in the next paper in 2018 that you have some techniques that are better, but then you can optimize choose one technique that really works best and build an ensemble of small models with only one performing techniques. And you have quite, quite good results with that. Um, and another advance that I think is, is, is important was on the side of community modeling when trying to model communities from stacking species distribution models. So first, you, we, we proposed this framework, SESAM, uh, with Carsten Habeck in the, in the past, actually I didn't put the name, it's, it's called Cezanne. And it's just how you can implement quite common knowledge about how communities assemble uh, through the different filters, like uh, dispersal using species pool approach, habitat filtering using uh, SDMs, uh, then interactions uh, using, for instance, assembly rules, and we propose, in addition, to use, if verified for your habitat or for your community, a kind of uh, environmental carrying capacity approach that, that is based on the idea that community would be saturated. And if such, then not all species that are pre-adapted to a given habitat can co-occur together. So you need assembly rules to select the ones that can actually happen. So, and, and this is a, that this was the main, I would say, improvement of Cezanne. So, it also raised interesting debate, like the saturation of communities. It's still not very clear if such communities are saturated, and it depends which one. And so, we, we showed in this paper what to do if you think your community is saturated, what you can, how you can use that, or if not, how, what you can do. But if you have saturation, and if you want to implement assembly rules then to select which species from the one predicted uh, you can keep in your community uh, is still a big question and it's not easy to answer. And so we tried many things which I I'm not presenting here, like looking at co-occurrences, looking at phylogenetic data, things like that. It didn't work really well, to be honest. And one rule that works best, and actually is, is not really a Baltic um, rule, it's more statistical rule, but that provides the best performance is what we call this probability ranking rule, the PRR, which is really based on this idea that you might over predict the number of species in a community if you use binarized species distribution models, predictions. Uh, so if you, for instance, have the predictions of in a community of six species with these probabilities for each, 
And you have somewhat an indication, it could be a macroecological model, it could be observations that tell you that in this type of community, you should have three species maximum. It's a saturation. Uh, you can rank the species in the order of the probabilities. And so, yeah, trying really to bring the, the, the richness prediction back to the diagonal line, to the, to the observed one. And you can use this, you can use um, this maximum richness to select the first three species in the order of probabilities. And one thing that was shown actually by statisticians is that the, the best way to estimate this maximum richness is actually to, to accumulate to sum the probabilities of all the species you've been predicted. And it works extremely well. Is better usually than macroecological models predictions and is also has a big advantage that it's embedded in the same framework. So you can use directly your species predictions to estimate the species richness as, and it's supposed to be unbiased. There's, there is a very nice paper by Carsten Dorman showing that. Um, and finally, you get the final composition. So basically, we, we showed later that this is this PR is a nice community-based uh, prediction threshold, thresholding rules that work best, better than trying to use the usual species optimized threshold thresholding rules like max uh, TSS or these type of things. So here you see that, and it's a bit long, I will not explain all the details, but uh, Daniel Scherher, who is actually here at, at VSL now, uh, developed this very nice framework where you use this SSCV, that's the usual way of uh, assessing the, the validation of SDM species by species. It's not optimized by community. And then he tried two approach where really on one which is really more advanced, the CCV cross, uh, community cross validation, where really sample the communities and evaluate the predictions at the level of communities instead of accumulating the, the individual species um, evaluation. And you see that if you use this more independent approach and that you read some trade on communities, the, this is the, the PRR uh, thresholding rule, uh, becomes the, the best, uh, provide the best performance in, in the two types of different uh, independent evaluation. So it's, it's, it has proved to be quite an efficient thresholding rules when you want to predict communities. And actually, this is when you want to predict communities with you know, individual species. But you might also want for, for individual species to get predictions that are not binarized, where you don't need to choose an, uh, a threshold that can be a bit arbitrary. And in most examples we have in the literature, uh, we use this, this approach where you binarize predictions for the present, for the future, and you compare them, you have winners, losers, and you can calculate turnovers. But you always depend species by species on a threshold that has been used to predict the presence or the absence. So a very simple alternative is to keep the predictions probabilist, and it's, it's really done more and more by many people, so it's not so new. But actually, and it's Daniel Scherer again, developed a quite nice framework in his 2019 paper with metrics that you can use to evaluate, for instance, community uh, similarity um, between based on, on probabilistic prediction instead of binary predictions, um, and also evaluate di directly the probabilistic community composition. So it's, I think it's really a, a, an approach worth to keep because it avoids the, the, the need to choose a um, threshold. Uh, a next advance, but that it's not the end of the story <laughs> that has been done, is the first, the awareness that when you build model at the local scale, like using restricted data sets. And this is done very often, actually. Many countries want SDMs for their country based on, on the monitoring data. Uh, and we have that in Switzerland. We use uh, the BDM data to do modeling uh, with Nick and others. It's quite common. We have done it also many times. But the problem with this is that you might, for many species, the data you use to fit the models will not reflect the entire niche of the species because the species can be distributed quite far outside the country. And so typically, especially for the climatic niche, 
you will get only a very small sample of the climatic initial of the species. But that's perfectly fine as long as you predict for the present, but it, it becomes a big problem if you predict for the future. Because in the future, you will need to know conditions to which species are actually adapted that are not visible in Switzerland, but that might become present in Switzerland. And I, I just take this nice figure that uh, uh, Mathieu Chevalier, a former postdoc in my group, developed. Um, and that shows really if you, if you take a species and you, 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 you just model part of a distribution of the species, so for a country, you, you first can show that you get only part of the niche of the species. And you can see here with the response curve how the, the true risk on, response curve should be the, the black one based on the entire range of the species, but how different the local response can be to the global one. So of course, then if you use the, the local model to predict to the future or possibly to another area, the model will fail and can fail quite dramatically. I think this is a really under considered uh, problem in many climate change assessments. So one solution is to use hierarchical multi-scale modeling to be sure to always account for the global distribution of the species and possibly combine it to finer data if you want to make, really make fine predictions at the local scale. So we illustrated that, for instance, with invasive species, um, here with the ragweed, um, but uh, ambrosia, but you, you can apply it basically to any uh, species and also to, to future projections. So here you see just the observed data at the world scale, the observed data, for instance, in Switzerland, and you can then get a model for Switzerland, a model for the world, for, from which you can clip what it would predict for Switzerland, and you can find a way to combine the two in the final predictions that account for the global uh, niche, but that also account for, for instance, more local uh, factors at much finer scale. So it's also a way to combine resolutions. You could have coarse resolution at large scale, fine resolution at local scale. One of the big questions is how you do that, and especially how you mix the two models. And there are many approaches possible. I will not detail them, but Mathieu has been doing quite an impressive job reviewing also a bit these techniques. And he's not the only one. Uh, Ruben Mateo, who is now in Spain, has also done uh, two papers where you review a bit the different approach you can use. Uh, Mathieu has a bit of Bayesian bias, so he, 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 he picked on many Bayesian approach, which are really very appropriate for this type of exercise. So it's really how you combine the, uh, the, the red will be the local model and the, the orange when you mix, you, you calculate coefficients for model based on the two scale and the yellow would be the, uh, the, the large scale. And you see also that then um, the F is for find, the C for course, how you combine the data at fine and coarse scale. And you can really do different uh, techniques. Some are called as data fusion, but they're actually kind of modeling approaches. And if you test this different approach, you can generate from some predictions for Switzerland on the present, on the future, and see the difference between the two. And here you have for the approach M1 that was in the previous slide, the approach M2, M3. So I really encourage you to go back to the uh, initial paper, uh, Chevalier et al. 2021 Ecological Application. It's just out. If you want to see a bit the difference between these techniques. But what is most important here is to see that you get really different predictions for the future. And sometimes the, the difference between the, the, the present and the future, so the scenario, can be quite affected by the choice of the data fusion. So I think it's, it's not solved. We, we are not yet fully sure. One thing I didn't mention is that some of these approaches run well for one species if you take a cluster and, 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 and have a lot of time, but it will simply not be applicable to many species. And that's a, one of the big other problems with some Bayesian approach, is that it just take too long. So we are still working on that, and I hope uh, I will mention later a collaboration with other people in Switzerland, including Nick and others. Uh, and we, we try to incorporate some really uh, reasonable solutions for that truncation problems, but using uh, fast, fast methods. Okay, so th these were a few advances, I think are important. 
And I just wanted to illustrate a few, few recent developments on more on the application of SDMs uh, in our study area that we did recently. One is, is trying to develop better predictors. So we had shown in these two papers, first a review of, of what factors are used in SDM for plants. So it's only on, for plants, but you see that climate is here, these two bar temperature and moisture. Moisture includes precipitation, so it's, it's not the right term, but and you see that all the other factors are much more neglected uh, in, in SDMs, especially soil, but also others like light. And a very nice development that Daniel did again was to, he's very creative, uh, was to try to see the power of in the ecological indicator values to assess what variables should theoretically be important and if they do improve SDMs when you include them. So what he did, he did a normal SDMs with many variables, all these variables from maps that we had that we thought were the best expression of these variables. So you can have a soil pH map. It doesn't mean that it's a good pH map. So what he did then, is he replaced in the models one by one, the variables corresponding by its Landolt ecological indicator value which was the average for the community. So he could obtain it because we have community plots. So he could calculate more or less the, the pH value from the ecological indicator value for a plot, uh, the humidity and so, so on. And what you see is that when you, when you add temperature, it doesn't improve nearly the, the, the model compared to the standard one. What it means is that the, the temperature maps we have are pretty good. They seems to correspond to the expertise we have on the ecology of species but it's not the same for the other variables. Most of them, you see, this is, I forgot to say, this is a difference in deviance of the models. So you see that as soon as you try to use an ecological indicator value instead of the mapped predictors for the other variables, and this also means this could not be spatially explicit. It was only for the plots where we had the data. You see big improvement, and you see that for soils, it's quite a big improvement. So we know that soil, of course, is very important. It's mostly pH here but uh, we miss good soil maps for this variable. And so uh, we, tr we started intense soil sampling in the study area, um, sampling many parameters, working with colleagues in geoscience for the, the soil lab in, in, in Lausanne. And you see that if you then include soil variables, at least at the level of the plots, you, you do actually improve models substantially for, for some species and not for all. So it, it really depends on the species ecology, of course, but for some species, it can be quite big improvements. Um, and we, we also tested other variables like snow cover duration. We had a very nice collaboration with remote sensing people in Lausanne to develop snow cover duration map using very long series of Landsat uh, image. Uh, and we obtained uh, using a method that was also applied by Miss Caliotto in the Arctic and you see also that it's a very varying story. For some species, you get big improvements when, when it's rather high here, and for others, low or, or counter uh, improvements uh, if, the, if the model is more adding noise than, than improving the models. And you just see that typically for alpine species like Salix herbacea or Soldanella alpina, you get quite high improvement of Vernica alpina. And so if you accumulate, of course, soil, then snow cover variables, it will, it should lead to improved models at the end. So another, uh, and, and also based on this soil sampling, we could also sample microorganisms. So we, we not only sampled soil uh, on Earth to, to make the physical chemical analysis, but we also did molecular analysis sequencing for, for many groups. Uh, to try to first understand if these micro guys were also driven by the same variables than the macro guys, but also then to see, or we will look in the future also more at interactions between these groups on these plants, for instance. So of course, environmental factors play a role for this microorganism, uh, for soil fungi. You see clearly that this is a, uh, an ordination that is based on the fungi data. And then we just added the label for the vegetation type that was occurring at the 
sampling place. And you clearly see big clusters. So it really shows the link between fungi communities and plant communities. You really have some fungi community associated to, plant, to some plant communities and so on. So the, the, you, you both have the information that fungi follow very clearly soil on temperature gradients, but they're also connected to plants along also the same gradients. And we did the same for bacteria, and this is a bit different graph because it was done by a different postdoc, but this is the network of interactions between the bacteria, OTUs, and the environmental variables. Oh, sorry, got blocked. Oh, back. And it's just interactions uh, graph, so you see basically variables that interact between them that are correlated, but you also see for groups of bacteria that are co-occurring, with which environmental variables they tend to be correlated. And you see that you have uh, typically temperature, pH, phosphorus, explaining quite tightly some groups of, of uh, bacteria. And we did the same type of ordination. And you see again you know, that if you, exactly as for fungi, for bacteria, if you do this ordination, you see that you also have a tight connection with the plant vegetation. So there is also, it's a bit the same story as for, uh, for, uh, for fungi and for protists, we are more at the beginning, uh, but we see already just that functional groups tend to follow already gradients. You have really clearly shift between uh, parasite and consumer along elevation, but also different taxonomic groups uh, and the richness of different taxonomic group is also quite nicely driven by environmental factors. But su surprisingly, protist is a, the group that is the least influenced by soil, and still very much influenced by soil, but it's still very much influenced by topoclimatic variables, much more than bacteria and fungi. And so we, based on, on all these models we had for the macro-organisms, for the micro-organisms, we, we wanted to compare the baseline importance of climate to predict uh, the different groups. And so is climate as important for, and of course it's air climate, that's the data we have, is it as important for soil microorganisms than for uh, more above ground uh, organisms? So you could expect the answer, but it, it, is, uh, it is at least shown here that clearly you have less importance of climate for below ground, Organisms, so you have fungi, bacteria, and protists. We are just missing the RK here, but we could do it for the RK as well. And for other group organisms like amphibians, reptiles, grasshoppers, butterfly, bumblebee, plants, uh, you have a vi variety. Uh, it doesn't, it's not so strong for bumblebees, but for all the other groups, it's quite largely greater than for microorganisms. And accordingly, if you do projections, based on climate for the future, for these different groups, you see, of course, much less change of communities predicted for the future for pedal ground organisms than for above ground organisms. It doesn't mean it will happen, it will be true. It means we really need to include also the soil in these predictions. And soil, of course, will also change with climate. So if something happens to these guys, it will be more through change of the soils caused by climate. But the, the air climate is less important for these, except a bit for protists. But still, it's less than macroorganisms. And so we, one of the big challenges, I think, is to develop now soil maps. And this is extremely hard. So you can still sample many sites, but then you need to interpolate, and you need to find a way to make a map, which is not easy for soils. So we tried, and at least pH works pretty well. For other variables, it's a bit more difficult. Uh, but so what we did, since it's difficult to get fine predictions, we, we just played with scenarios of change of soil variables. As we were doing at the very beginning with climate, when we didn't have precise climate change scenario, we were just adding 1.5 degree, for instance, to see what would happen. So we did the same here by playing a bit with uh, future predictions for um, pH and uh, total organic content. Uh, and here you just, there is no prediction of species or whatever, it's just the change for our scenario between the present and the future, how the distribution of the variables change 
for climate, for topography, and for soil uh, in the future. So topography doesn't change much. It, it means you, if you increase the temperature, then you see that it, the, the, these variables along topography will change a bit the distribution, but not as much as for climate or soil. So using this, then you can try to make predictions for microorganisms. And we did it for bacteria so far. I'm still working on the other groups. Uh, and you see that if you, you here is just, I think it's more to show the, the potential and the ideas how, how we could go further. Is you have this scenario where you have a combination of pH decreased, pH as now, pH increased. Uh, and we, we found values in the literature that were reasonable as a possible increase or decrease for the future. And we did the same for talk. Uh, and one of the reasons is that in the literature, you find all predictions. It could increase or decrease uh, with climate change, depending on the type of models people use, what they put in the analysis and so on. And, and doing that, you can, you can predict sp uh, bacteria distributions. And here we just summarize by the diversity, the Shannon diversity, and you see the current pattern on how it could change according to the different scenarios. So you could have increase or you could have decrease in some cases like here uh, of Shannon diversity in the future, depending if you increase or decrease uh, total organic content on pH. So you see that decreasing total, total organic content on pH will lead still to more or less decrease with uh, at most elevation except very high, but it's not very significant. On increasing TOC on pH should lead to quite high increase in Shannon diversity for, for bacteria, which is not too surprising because bacteria also follow a kind of gradient of, of richness along the elevation. Okay, so the conclusion of that is that uh, we are moving on, it's still ongoing, but we are also now modeling the other groups as well and it will keep us busy for some more years. Now, just reaching the end, the two challenges I wanted to, to, to mention. The first is this idea that now we're modeling many groups. Um, I've shown at the beginning, we need systematic conservation planning. We need to really start to try to show what could happen or where could be the best place to protect. Uh, so use systematic approaches in conservation planning if, you, if we want to help decision makers, stakeholders, to manage the, the landscape. And I think we're still missing even the, the, the knowledge on how to do it the, in the best way, uh, because few examples of, uh, of spatial conservation planning includes many taxonomy groups. Most of them include vertebrates and plants, sometimes other groups or insects, butterflies, but not many. And so we are not sure that by protecting this group, we will protect all biodiversity. We're not sure of an umbrella effect for in that sense. And I think SDMs on new data collected could help because you can specialize the information and try then to, to feed spatial conservation planning with it. So we did, for instance, ex an exercise with, with different groups than, you, than used uh, plant, insect, reptile, amphibians. Um, in the, our study area, you see that we used a kind of classical approach, priority score consensus, where you really base the choice on the existing uh, conservation areas on uh, uh, another that is totally objective uh, based in zonation that will try just to define the best possible places. And you see that actually, if you look at, compared to the new uh, network of, of protected area, the existing or setting new ones, the actually the future, um, the, in the future, the, the zonation consensus uh, would cover a large, will, will uh, identify a larger area to be protected uh, if you don't get, stay uh, restricted to the existing conservation areas. So that was just the first step. And then we, I'm, I'm moving back to the beginning of my talk where I was mentioning the ecosystem services. You can also start to include ecosystem services if they make sense for the type of conservation you want to do. And here we, we, we mapped uh, 10 uh, ecosystem services for our area. You can see the different ones. Uh, they're in three groups, mainly provisioning, regulating, and recreational. 
and we included them together with the other data uh, that we use in the previous spatial conservation planning exercise. So we added the ecosystem services, run again the, the, the program, the, the prioritization. And what you can see is actually you can identify trade-offs between ecosystem service and biodiversity. And actually putting too much on, so in, in short, we, we were playing with weights you give to ecosystem service compared to biodiversity and depending on how you increase the weight, you can really affect much largely the biodiversity. So putting a very large weight to uh, ecosystem service as would probably be done through a kind of economic uh, focused uh, approach uh, can really harm even more the biodiversity. So we will, we will need to find or we'll have to find a good compromise to, to, to protect biodiversity while favoring the some ecosystem services. And just not to show that there is a very nice example that has already been conducted in uh, Geneva by Anthony Lehmann and colleagues, uh, really in close collaboration with the state. It's a big advantage, it's a small state, uh, and they have quite impressive data for the, the entire uh, state. And so they, are, they have been running uh, uh, this type of spatial conservation planning, but really with the state directly, uh, with the idea to, to, to improve the protection of biodiversity on ecosystem service, including also connectivity and different things. So I, I really encourage you to have a look to this paper. It's a, it's a quite nice example. And so another, uh, on, on just, yeah, this is still a bit rally done, just to show there was this uh, review done uh, not so long ago that shows that really uh, prioritization based on SDM or at least including SDMs are still quite scarce compared to uh, non uh, SDM prioritization. So this is 10 times more without SDMs. So we still have some way to, to, to go uh, and, and try to really develop comprehensive and, and you will see I, I will come to that very soon uh, as a challenge for Switzerland. So the second is will bring me to this is is um, okay. We need to improve spatial conservation planning by including more species, and not only from SDMs, but I, I would say just generally with as many groups as we can. Um, but if we use SDMs, we need to be sure we use kind of robust SDMs, and it raised the question of how to estimate or how to evaluates if a uh, model is good enough to be included in a spatial conservation plan. So there are many existing pi SDM pipelines, and I just heard there is a new tool developed. And these are mostly online pipelines, but it's not even mentioning all the R package, like SDM, uh, ENMFR, and all these. Uh, so there is increasingly tools to do that, but the tools will include different things, and I think we should really think about what we need to put in these tools uh, before managers use them. On, uh, on, on, this is important because SEM's prediction are already quite heavily used in biodiversity assessment. So the IPBES report, I would say that most projections, if not all, for biodiversity are based on SEMs. And it's quite a lot of paper reviewed. And I would say that any paper published on a group that gives some results will be included in the assessment. So there is no filtering. And that's a, somewhat a problem that we identified with a group that was again uh, led by Miguel Arojo, and Nick was also in this group, um, that actually at the moment, any paper I said will be included in biodiversity assessment, uh, even if actually the, the, the models was not very good and had a kind of higher level of error. So there, it raised the question, should we filter, should we establish standards uh, and have standards under which we don't include some predictions in this biodiversity assessment to be sure that we don't, um, you, we, we don't include um, wrong predictions. So this group has been working four years, uh, probably, on developing different standards, and I will not show you the tables, but we developed four big tables that correspond to these four big groups. Um, it's really about, you see the four categories here, model evaluation, model building, predictor variable, response variable. 
Uh, we tried to propose a first set of standards, but of course it, it, it should evolve and it should be taken by the international community and be improved. And we assessed somewhat how these standards were uh, met or not in papers. So we, we used a, a random selection of 400 SEM papers and really applied the standards to all these papers to see where we were for the different categories. And you can see there's, of course, different criteria in each of the category. So model performance, model outputs. And this is just a temporal trend. So see how these, these standards have been improving or not improving over time. So do we do a good job to more or less usually improve the level of the, the models, uh, the, the practice used to fit the models or not? And here we have these spider graphs where you see with the four categories, uh, over the 400 uh, papers, how it, it situates using different quantiles. And you see that actually the, 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 the way it fixed best, the way we, we nearly goes for some categories to the gold standard uh, is for the response variable. So the species data, we get better and better. Also, thanks to, to genetics, we get more and more data. But we still have a lot to do on all the other fields, on, uh, for instance, uh, evaluation, some aspects of evaluation are still uh, on the edge or uh, model building, we, we could still do a better job like for, for, for variable selections and so on. And there are an increasing number of papers now that get published on these standards. And I think this is a really important literature. It can sound boring, but I think we, we will need at some point to agree on some standards with the entire international community. And I think some that are especially important and that were, uh, again, quite connected to, to Nick, is the one by Damaris Zurel, who was here as well, and who said one of the most important papers, I think she proposed this, uh, this uh, a way to actually assess papers on using the metadata that we use to build the models. And associated to this, uh, Corey Mero, uh, who was also here, a, a co-author, and the last author of this paper, propose actually a, a, an R package, which I've not much experience yet, but uh, that can extract actually the metadata used to fit the model. So it's to know which evaluation met, uh, techniques or metrics you use, which, uh, which uh, techniques you use for an ensemble, or did you use an ensemble or not, to have all this information so that you can assess how a model was developed and how, if you can rely or not on the predictions. So you could realize that there, is a, there was just no evaluation. So you have predictions, if they were not evaluated, how can you trust them? So it's, it's really important to, to, to think to these things. And there is also standards to be established on the data and things like that. So we also talked about that in a paper with uh, Rob Anderson and others uh, associated to GBIF. But I think this is a very important um, development. So just to finish, uh, for, for on our side, uh, one of the, the, the ongoing project and, and we, which will really develop the next steps from much of our research is this Valpar project in Switzerland, which is about Swiss parks, but also uh, includes the national scale, which is a quite large project granted by the Office of the Environment, where you see the University of Zurich, uh, ETH Zurich, and uh, University of Geneva, in addition to Lausanne, are included. Uh, so, Loic, uh, no, Loic, this is not it. And we, in, in this project, we have to develop, and this is on my side, uh, modeling of nearly all groups of biodiversity in Switzerland at the national scale. And for that, we partner with uh, Loic Pellissier, who is also here, not today, but uh, because he also had a project that was requiring this, and actually then we realized that Nick also had a project that was trying to do that. So we somewhat built a kind of consortium of people to try to develop a modeling pipeline for Switzerland uh, that could in the long term be improved by uh, the community of modelers in Switzerland and be connected to info species. And we would really like it at the end to, to be a kind of standalone um, uh, tool that info species can use with just with guidance of modelers. And uh, for this, we are already collaborating strongly with Nick, with Loic, 
Florian Altermatt, Anton Lehmann, Ole Seerosen, uh, Adrian. But I guess in the future, it will certainly enlarge and include all the modelers that are interested in Switzerland. And so I will not de detail the, the pipeline, but you see it includes already a lot of the things I've mentioned are, as advances, like the hierarchical approach, ESMs when needed, and so on. So I hope it will do a good job. We are just finished developing the pipeline, and now we are going to, to run it on uh, as many species as possible before our next spring. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope I was not too long. And, uh,